What's up, Rozones? Welcome to the Ozone and welcome to Epilogue 3, a reaction. I have not read this story yet, or this epilogue. Uh, apparently, it is amazing. Apparently, it pops off in this epilogue. So I'm super excited to read it. Let's just get straight into it. The footsteps that have prompted Lucia. Yes, we are still following the same group. That is so exciting. Lucia and her friends, and not friends, cower among dusty, caved-in cardboard boxes in a dark, musty storeroom were unlike any footsteps Lucia had heard before. Measured and steady, the steps hit the hallway's linoleum flooring with a bizarre combination of grace and heaviness. The steps were precise taps, barely touching the floor before moving on. At the same time, the steps were weighty. Each tap created a vibration that judded the storeroom. The reverberation was a disturbing reminder that a Thin wall separated Lucia and the others from whatever was stalking down the hallway outside the door that Adrian had just locked. What? Joel began. Shh, Lucia admonished. Glancing at the others, Lucia re realised her unease was unshared by everyone. Uh, sorry, was shared by everyone. Uh, Lucia couldn't see the last of their group, Jace, because he stood behind her, but he could feel his staccato uh, breaths falling against the uh, kinkly curls on top of her head. She could smell his breath... The funnel cake he had eaten at the carnival had left a sickly sweet residue that had been soured by his fear. Wow, wait, by, by his fear? Oh. Okay. Okay. I see. I see where this is going. Uh, the footsteps came closer and closer to the door until they stopped right in front of it. Whatever it was, it stood out there listening, but everyone held their breaths. But then, the already barely there light in the storage room blinked out. They were engulfed in darkness. Oh, okay. Behind Lucia, Jace gasped. Lucia winced at the sound. She stared hard into the darkness, listening for even a hint of movement outside the door. One second, two seconds, three seconds, she counted. The dim light returned. It was flickering, but it stood on. Lucia realised she was still counting seconds, and she stopped. The counting somehow made the terror grow stronger. The footsteps then began to move away. They jerked, uh, they juked him. Okay. He was using the lights, controlling him to... Wait. He was using the lights, controlling him to see if anyone would react in the room. Oh, I see. The footsteps started again. They were wrapped in three different sounds. A hiss, a metallic scrape, and a grating rasp. She didn't want to imagine what could possibly make the sound. She glanced over at the others to watch their taunt expressions showed... Uh, to which their taunt expressions showed they shared the same thought. Adrian, the big athletic guy of the group, takes the role of the leader. When the footsteps of the thing slowly descend into the hallway, he opens the door, signalling them all to, le the, to sneak out one by one. As Lucia went out, she glanced back at the room they were just in. The light was no longer flickering. It was steady and normal. He controls the lights. Okay. Okay. When, when you say he, you mean burn trap, right? The endo? Okay. Uh, this gang sneaks around... And as they do so, they make their way across uh, across to the to another storage room quietly. As Lucia old boxes, the smell what 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 as Lucia old boxes what the smell is putrid. The boxes have a brittle and dense smell to them. Such a dense smell it could make her throat scratch. I wonder why. Fire. Yeah. Okay. Good job picking that up. They get into the storage room and have a debriefing. We need to find a way out of here, Adrian says. You think? Joel said at the full volume. He was met with a chorus of shh from everyone. Joel held up his oversized, rubbery-looking hands in surrender. He tried, to swag, uh, he tried the swag thing he does again after embarrassment, failing miserably. They talk about trying to move the barriers. Um, if I can't move it, it can't be moved, Joel said again at full volume. <laughs> this is quite funny. Uh, Lucia rolls her eyes, thinking he is an idiot. Adrian proposes an idea. I think we should split up. We need to find a way out fast. Splitting up in pairs will speed up that process by searching the rooms. They all think about the idea. Now everyone else spoke up to talk about the idea in whispers. With the exception of the clueless Joel, they all spoke out at once. Me and Wade will buddy up, Joel said. I'd like to pair with Lucia, Kelly said. And with Adrian, Jay said. We can group up together, Hope, Nick said. Wait, so there's eight of them? I did not realise there was eight of them. Oh no, wait, there's six of them. Never mind. Uh... Oh no, there's eight of them. Yeah, there's eight. I did not even realise there was eight of them. That is a lot. 
Uh, yeah. Okay. Lucia is caught off guard that Kelly wants to pair up with her, but she doesn't complain as she doesn't know Kelly that much. Maybe this will be the time they can become friends. Adrian, who had apparently decided he was in charge, pointed at the others in a non-obnoxious way into their pairs. Jace apparently carries a portable drawing tablet with him. <laughs> what? And Adrian asks him to give him the tablet so they can draw out the map. For the next several minutes, the group argued over the placements of the rooms on the map. They had scouted the building prior to their encounter with the body parts, but they still knew relatively what rooms were there. Uh, Jace is tired of this and takes his tablet and starts drawing out a perfect map of the restaurant and its approximate room locations. He's described as being one with an artist's eye. Thank you, Jace, Adrian says. Adrian is now like, okay, ahem, let's do it this way. Ahem, ahem. <laughs> uh, Jace and I will take the main dining room, arcade, lobby and party rooms, Adrian spoke. That's where all the body parts are, though, Jace squeaked. Don't worry, I have your back, Adrian said. Jace gave a frown in response, but nodded. Um, Joel and Wade, you guys will scout the employees' lounge, the furnace room, and the storage closets. This is literally said with no context, by the way. Damn cordon teasers. Wow. Uh, Hope, Adrian continued, you and Nick take the backstage room, the stage, and the kitchen. Hope and Nick gave a similar nod uh, and, not, and frown. After assigning their roles, they all split up, and for once in his life, Joel realises it is the appropriate time to shut up. <laughs> Perspective switches to Kelly and Lucia. They're in the dining area, trying to get to the entrance area. Kelly trotted alongside Lucia as they weave around broken tables and chairs and inexplicable piles of broken robot endoskeletons. Ooh, yes, actual endoskeletons. These are differentiated from the corpse. There's apparently a lot of endos. Too many. Some are li literally barricades of endos. Uh, they take a turn near where the entrance is and enter a door to a long hallway. Lucia looks at the walls as they move down the next hallway to their assigned positions. She gives in to her surroundings and makes note of old peeling posters. Are those the original characters? Kelly asked her. It's not the rock stars. Uh, Lucia gazed at the posters which depicted a top hat wearing brown bear, a blue bunny cradling a guitar, a bright yellow chick holding a toothy cupcake poised on a plate, and a pirate fox sporting a black eye patch and a hook for a hand. Lucia nodded. Scott considers Bonnie blue. Wow. Yeah, so this is the original characters. What? But they were burnt. Oh god, no they weren't. Oh yeah, okay, because they're in bo Yeah, of course they were burnt. Yeah. So the these are just like, what's the remnants of them? Lucia and Kelly enter the bathroom area. They are going to kick down the stall doors to see what's behind them, and it cuts to Joel and Wade scavenging in the employees' lounge. Yo, dude, Joel said, reaching out into one of the black metal lockers lining the back wall of the employees' lounge. Check this out. He held up something small and rectangular. It's a pager. How's that for a blast from the past? Wade's sitting there trying to screw open a ventilation duct. Can you keep it down, please? Can we use old tech in Pizzeria Simulator? Wait, I don't even know, I don't know what a pager is. Give me two seconds, I'm gonna look up what a pager is. What is, wait, oh, my Google is not working. Uh, what is a pager? Pager. A pager, also known as a beeper or bleeper, is a wireless telecommunications device that receives and displays alphanumeric or voice messages. Oh, so like in Pizzeria Simulator? Yeah, okay. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Yes. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. I love this. Love it a lot. Uh, Wade internal monologue. Joel is kind of his only friend, but sometimes he can't deal with his stupidity. Joel closed the locker he was riffling through. It made a loud metallic smack. Wade put his face into his palms. Wait, 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 wait. Imagine they try and play the recordings on here and it's just Henry's voice. Please, please play. Please play the pager. Um, Make some more noise, why don't you? Do you want to make more noise? Wade flung at Joel. Maybe we can get whatever was out in the hallway to come and face off with us, huh? Joel isn't taking it seriously. Joel puffed his chest. Think we can take him? Wade sighed and continued to work on unscrewing the vent. He said to Joel, so you think it's a him? Huh? Joel asked, clueless. Wade continued to work on unscrewing the vent, didn't respond to Joel, and then Joel goes again like, what are you doing? I want to see where the duck work goes. 
Wade said. Maybe it leads to an exterior vent. Sounds like a long shot, Joel snickered. Wade bristled. Think you're going to find an exit in one of those lockers? He snapped. As soon as he finished talking, he heard a fingernails on a chalkboard like Screech. He whirred and glared at Joel. What are you doing? However, Joel is standing there wide-eyed. He is not laughing. That wasn't me. I didn't do anything, he whispered. Then he pointed at a wall a few feet from where Cade, uh, Wade uh, kneeled. It came from over there behind the wall. Wade froze. He thought about the sound. Joel was right. It hadn't come from behind Wade. He heard it again. Metal scraping against metal. Yes. He's dragging his claws against the walls. Well, does he have claws yet? Well, actually, maybe, yeah. Because Bonnie, we know that Bonnie had claws because of Monty's thingy. But if we're saying that this is the original, like, intent with Bonnie. Oh, no, I don't know. I don't know what I'm talking about. It was because it was the, it's like the original Scrap Trap or, yeah, I don't know. Um, I lost where I, I am. Uh, maybe you're right about the duct work, Wade said. The quietly uh, and stealthily sneak out trying to avoid coming across the thing scraping the walls. Scott Cawthon says, fuck you and leaves you tensed. And it cuts to Hope and Nick about to head behind the main stage. They lift the red velvet curtain up behind. This is reminding me of like Until Dawn. They should totally make like an Until Dawn-esque kind of FNAF game. That would be so cool. Where you're like, you've got different characters perspectives and you do different things and then it like tenses up and everything happens at once and you've got loads of action and stuff. That would be really cool. Um, they're about to go behind the stage until they hear a slamming sound coming from one of the party rooms. Sorry, a whisper came out. It's just Adrian and, and Jace, Nick said. They head backstage, but suddenly the stage lights start flickering. The light is flickering enough just to illuminate so they can see three costume wardrobes at the far end of the room. Nick walked toward the wardrobes. Hope started after them, but then she stopped. A sharp tingle between her shoulder blades spun her around. She knew that sensation. It was the sensation of being watched. The closer she gets to the wardrobe, the feeling gets worse. The prickling sensation was now skimming down her spine and throughout her body. It wasn't directional, she realised. It was nearby. Nick, be careful, she says. Despite her hurt feelings of Adrian choosing Jace over her, Hope was glad to be paired with Nick. Hope and Adrian made a great couple, but they didn't get uh, have the connection Hope had with Nick. She and Nick had been cheerleading together for three years. They never considered being a couple. Their link wasn't romantic, but they got uh, each other. They were in sync. Nick was like a brother. Hope never had. Nick is comforting her, holding her hand as they get close to the closet. It's okay, I'm scared too. Together they step toward the hall, black... Uh, sorry, the tall black painted cabinets as they did the wood floor creaked. One of the cabinet doors swung open. Hope sucked in her breath and tightened her grip on Nick's hand. They both froze. The door opened on its own. They sat there in silence. Nick, trying to convince himself everything was okay, tells her that it might have been, might have just been the unsteady padding on the floor that caused it to slowly hinge open since they stepped on a creaky floorboard. The yellow glow from the half-dead stage lights high up on the wall in ahead of them was sputter spluttering sorry, as if the beams were coming from candles instead of old incandescent bulbs. Uh, <laughs> it, despite the uneven illumination though, the light easily reached into the wardrobe and revealed a cluster of bright animal costumes. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. Nick reached out and touched a blue bunny ear. He flicked it aside. It's spare costumes. Maybe that's where the blob got its masks. Who knows? I don't know about that. Nick realised that the wardrobe of of Ruli goes deeper than usual. Oh no. Oh no, what? <laughs> Hope knew her body wasn't trying to warn her, but because her body didn't speak in words, she didn't fully understand what it was trying to tell her. Therefore, the warning didn't come in time. Hope didn't realise at the time the extent of the danger until Nick was suddenly seized by something unseen, something that yanked him so far into the wardrobe that he disappeared behind the four fur costumes. Nick, Hope started toward the wardrobe, blood pounding in her ears, sorry. She only took two steps before the costumes churned and Nick shot into view. He's on the ground, still alive. Nick, Hope breathed in relief. Nick stumbled away from the wardrobe. His gaze was locked on Hope. She met his eyes, which were bulging and jittery. What? Hope said. Nick emitted the most deranged chuckle Hope had ever heard. Hope, Hope, my arm is gone. My arm is gone. He looked down. His tone was dispassionate, empty of life. Wow, wow. Uh, I kind of missed something. Wait, I kind of zoned out. Uh, he just... I didn't realise... 
Okay. I'm a little bit confused, but we'll, we'll carry on going. Uh, Hope shifted her gaze from Nick's face to his torso, and she immediately wondered how she could have failed to see it right away. Nick's arm was gone. She tried to let out a scream, but couldn't get it out. Behind Nick, the costumes seethed, almost faster than Hope could process the movement. Metal hands speared through the costumes and encircled Nick's throat. Hope was transfixed, unable to move, even to breathe. The problem was that her brain couldn't compute something that was so not part of the world she saw. In Hope's world, blackened metal skeletons enmashed in tangled black wire protruding from segmented joints and pumping pistons didn't move with lightning speed. It's referring to just one animatronic, FYI, just generalising how out of the world it is. In Hope's experience, stripped black metal skulls didn't leer with protruding glowing white eyes above a gaping hinged mouth filled with huge white teeth uh, and in hope's universe sharp metal fingers didn't twist off a head with a wet snap as if it was a bottle cap there it is when hope saw the torn remains of nick's neck though she found herself in this new appalling reality and it annihilated her for several seconds hope could do nothing but stare into the stark black pupils gleaming in the middle of the robot's swollen white eyes his eyes changed color in the previous epilogue they were orange very true very true. He's just standing there into Hope's very being as he holds the neck, the, sorry, the head of Nick with his claws. He's not chasing her, just standing, seeing her reaction. The eyes were set in metal squared and separated by a vertical swollen metal nodule, nodule that swept up to the top of the robot's skull, creating a narrow dome like frontal bone. This part of the robot's cranium was filthy, spotted with rust colored stains that Hope's mind vaguely processed as dry blood. Are those really wires though? The endo didn't have wires tangled within him last epilogue, and it sure is odd that the cranium is described slightly differently. Conspiracy as bone-like. Uh, the robot's intense gaze mesmerized Hope, even as her brain fought to process the creature's existence, and the blood that gushed between the articulated fingers at the end of its massive metal arms. After then let go of Nick's head, he watches it roll toward Hope. In those few seconds, time slowed down so much that Nick's head seemed to tumble over and over endlessly as it headed toward the stage floor. This is amazing. Hope was mesmerized by Nick's lifeless head, replaced by a lock of Nick's thick brown hair slick with his blood. Then the eyes again, and then the stark white of Nick's brain stem, jutting past the ragged edges of the skin at his jawline. His head rolled off the stage, hitting the floor with a splat. Afton stood there, looking at Hope. In that moment, Hope's brain rebooted. This time, it was able to get across her body's message, run. As soon as the robot took one step toward her, she screamed. She started to run. The story then cuts to Lucio and Kelly. They found something strange while in an office they were scavenging. They tried to look into a vent duct. But strangely, not far from the vent's opening, just a couple of feet, stood a concrete wall blocking the rest of the shaft. They took note of it for later and decided to walk out to tell the rest of the group. Kelly wanted to pair with Lucia because she admired Lucia's individuality and confidence who knew this who knew so much brainless was hair who knew so much braininess was hidden under all that hair she playfully flicked a couple of lucia's curls lucia grinned and she didn't resist when kelly took her arm as if they'd been besties forever it was the fear lucia knew they'd been bonding because they were facing a terrifying situation together and now they were joking because of the relief Fear has been a very, very huge part of the theming of this book. The fact that there's so much focus on fear, especially the metaphorical sense of fear, souring Jace's breath, makes me want to believe that your fear will consume you, and it's not your flesh that sustains me, it is your fear, meant more than just creepy lines. Yes, good point. They hadn't found a way out, but Lucia figured that being in one place is a derelict restaurant filled uh, with decomposing body parts and inhabited by something that had decidedly threatening footsteps was a victory... Uh, worth appreciating. Maybe Kelly was interrupted by Hope's screams. Kelly grabbed Lucia's arm so hard that her fingernails dug into Lucia's skin. Lucia and uh, Kelly exchanged a glance and darted down the hall. They skidded through the archway to the dining room, but they didn't get any further. Run! Hope screamed, sc screamed, screamed as she careened toward them, waving her arms. They did not hesitate. Fight or flight kicked in, and they darted down the hall. What is it? Adrian called out as he ran from the arcade. What the hell? Joel bellowed as they came out. For some reason, nothing is chasing her. They're confused. Why wasn't the thing chasing her? He's playing with them. He wanted Hope to be scared. He took one step, but didn't chase her. They all catch up to her outside the men's restroom. Her face was so white it was practically translucent. Her eyes were red. Tears streaked her smudged cheeks. 
Lucia looked down the hall to see if anything was coming after them. She looked at either direction, then she looked at the others. She frowned. Uh, where's Nick? Lucia asked. As soon as she asked that, Hope wailed and collapsed to the floor, screaming. She can't properly get her words out, she's just babbling and bawling out. Hope let out a wail and her legs went out from under her. Adrian caught her and lifted her. Lucia's stomach churned. Tremors cascaded through her body, chilling her, and they brought them... Uh, and they brought with them a miserable knowing that she denied the, that she tried to deny. Sorry, I am butchering all of this. Nick is dead, she babbled. He's dead. It's not over yet. The others look at each other in shock, trying to get their words in. Their fight or flight is kicking in, knowing their friend is dead. We can't stay out in the open like this, Adrian said. As to affirm his statement, a long grinding noise resounded through the building. It came from all directions at once, seeming to have no point of origin. Come on, Lucia said. The parts and service room is filled with metal parts. If we hide in there, we can find something to use as a weapon. They want the person's service to hide and immediately lock the door. Lucia regrets that decision immediately. Yes, the room was filled with metal that could be used as weapons, but the room was also creepy and extreme. Its lighting, already spotty when Lucia and Kelly had explored it earlier, was now flickering as if struggling to stay on. Crammed full of animatronic suits and robotic Eleanor skeletons, the room was set up like a beauty shop for robotics. It contained three metal chairs complete with clamps. The chairs could have doubled for torture devices. The chairs were flanked by a dozen of workbenches strewn with robotic parts. The suits, rigid and upright, stood around the periphery of the room, making it appear as if a dozen or so Freddy Fazbear characters were surrounding them. That is amazing. Lucy had known that the suits were empty. Um, she, and Charlie, uh, she and Kelly had checked them all, none contained the endoskeletons necessary to animate them. Still, the suits starring white eyes and open mouths looked way too lifelike. Hope spoke in a flat tone, her words slow and measured, seeming em motionless, but Lucia knew her emptiness was a facade. Emotions Hope couldn't process, yet bubbled below her stiff re recitation of the facts. We were looking behind the curtains in the flickering room, Hope began. Nick thought there might be an exit at the back of the wardrobes, I was nervous, something didn't feel right. But I didn't say anything. It, then it came out the wardrobe. It shot out so fast I didn't see him real. It took his arm and then it took him by the neck. It grabbed his neck, it ripped his head off. Hope had stopped crying. Her face was a slack. She was staring at one of the endoskeletons. Hope was in shock, obviously. What was it? Jace asked. It was big and metal and shiny and black, Hope said. A skeleton, but not a skeleton. Awful eyes, massive teeth, filthy, covered in dried blood. Hope, we don't understand. Can you tell us more? Hope shook her head, but she pointed. They all turned and looked at one of the endoskeletons propped against the wall. It was that, only bigger. Oh my gosh, Hope said. Something isn't right. Lucia kept looking at the animatronic suits that surrounded them. She was sure that everyone could hear the throbbing of her heart. When Kelly and Lucia had searched this room, the animatronic suits had been empty, but how long had they been in the hallway? They'd been so concerned about Hope, so stupefied by her story, Lucia had no idea how much time had passed. What if... And an endoskeleton like that could get into one of the suits. Everyone turned and looked at the dusty characters. Lucia's gaze shifted into each one in turn. She studied a goofy critter dressed in green overalls, a sly-looking orange cat, and a huge grey dog, don't panic, it's a costume, not fetch, with purple poodle-like scruff on the top of its head and around its neck, wrists and ankles. Wow, this is... This is weird. Next to the dog was another dog. Its lolling tongue gave a friendly expression in, expression in, spite, of a spike, ex, uh, in spite of its spiked collar. As she studied it, the dog moved. The light overhead um, gave out. One of the guys grunted. It was quiet, then the lights were back on. They were still weak and stable, but they were on. In that fraction of a second, the floppy-eared dog stepped forward and its arms came up. It grabbed Hope's biceps, just as Lucia cried, Look out! It knew how to get into a costume. Lucia's war uh, warning was worthless. By the time she got the words out, the thing in the suit had already torn Hope's arms from her body. Oh, what? What? What are you talking about? Are you serious? The sound was an endless keen of indescribable pain and shock. It careened around the room, assaulting them with the desperate finality of what ha was happening. As the scream coursed around them, the homicidal thing grabbed Hope's torso, flipped her upside down, and wrenched her legs free of her hips. This is amazing. What? Hope's scream crescended to an impossibly high octave. It continued to drill into Lucy's ears as the Freddy thing, referring to it being a random costume, once again inverted Hope's body before grabbing it and rest resting it from her neck. 
I'm lost. Oh, there we are. Uh, Hope stopped screaming. She was dead. He had given Nick mercy, but let Hope die in an agonizing way for whatever reason. Lucia was held in place in shock. She didn't realize what the stickiness was that was gluing her shirt to her body. She looked down. She was drenched in Hope's blood, and so was everyone else. For two, se to bear. For two long seconds, no one moved. They all stared at the carnage that used to be Hope. Adrian's eyes were locked on the vacant gaze of Hope's disembodied head. This is so fucked up because Adrian was Hope's boyfriend. Scott wanted to point that out for the first for the horror of his realization. Yeah, yeah. They started scrambling, trying to get the door unlocked. The things started stomping toward them. Behind them, the heavy tapping footsteps that were now too familiar started their way. Lucia wanted to cover her ears so she couldn't hear the hiss and rasp that paired with the taps. Joel got the door open and he tore through it. The others scrambled after him. The thing came after them. They bolted as one down the hall. To be continued in some mechanophobia. Wow. That's cool. That was a cool epilogue. That was event packed. Um, I feel like the second epilogue was kind of filler. But this was action packed and I loved that. Uh, two deaths as well. Uh, it seems like we're going to go from eight down, down and down further and, and further probably down to like one or two uh, main characters and then uh, we'll see if they are able to escape or not but this is wow I, I, I love this this is great uh, one last thing before the live reading channel closes uh, epilogue one although the pizzeria's electrical systems were mostly shot and Gil and his teammates had to set up work lights around the room the stage lights for reasons no one understood always shone brightly oh that's foreshadowing because it shows that the endoskeleton is there. Wait, it seems the light manipulation thing was foreshadowed since Epilogue 1 and further implies that maybe Afton's spirit was already tied to the building before he got there. Oh, okay. I don't know. I don't really... I'm still 50-50 on whether Afton is here or not yet. Because the endoskeleton is just doing what it's being told to do. But at the same time, it is very... Uh, malicious. So, yeah, and I was very confused about the dog cat thing. So let me know in the comments what you think about this entire epilogue. I enjoyed it. Um, yeah, it was very action-packed. Love it. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you later. Goodbye. <laughs>